Welcome back to another episode of Fret Buzz the Podcast, a podcast for musicians focusing on how we musicians and professionals approach our craft, giving insight to help us all become more informed and better musicians. Hi, I'm your host, Aaron Sefcik, and this week we're getting into part two with Paul Barsom all about, well, finding your voice within music, really. Um, all of this is because, of course, Paul has released a new album, Boy Interrupted by the Weed Garden. So definitely go on over to paulbarsom.com, listen to it. It's really good. Um, you'll have a better idea of what we've been talking about in these episodes, but definitely check it out. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button. Next week, we've got uh, a really good guest that you're going to want to check out. Um, and other than that, well, let's jump right into part two with Paul Barsom on Fret Buzz, the podcast. That's one of the things, like Tony mentioned earlier, like the, my path through creative work to this thing is kind of odd and a little unique. And um, one of the byproducts of that is that there's elements of just about every kind of music I've ever heard on this album. But it means that it doesn't fit into a genre. You know, it's some kind of rock. But I mean, I've been thinking about it for a while. Like, what, I mean, what? Let me just ask you guys: like, what? What kind of? What is this? <laughs> well, I, 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 I've said, I've said, with you asked me this question. We, you and I have talked about it. I, I look at the here. Here, I have two things about this. I think one, it fits if if you could put it into a genre, which I think is really something you shouldn't do. I think well, if you put it into a genre, for me, I, other I, I think it right. feels more like progressive pop is what it feels like. But that mm -hmm. being said, I think it's something unique because it's written by a composer, truthfully. I mean, think about it. Like 90% of the people who are out there doing songwriting are not are not classical composers, Paul. They're just, they're yeah, just not. They're, they're still, they're, I don't, yeah, okay, all right. You see what I'm saying? So like the, I think the path, the pathway is is different and and I think it's hard to classify it. But, but the second point I wanted to make is like, going with what we're saying today do you think like with all the stuff we have out there all the technology do we need do we need to even need to have labels do we need to have genres um is it just enough to kind of have like stuff you're producing which is like these classical or classic rock structures that are kind of have these compositional elements you know sort of surrounding them these really ambient pieces i mean there's so many elements of this album uh, so many styles that are there isn't it enough just to say here's what i can write here's the stuff i produce and not have to put a label to it and say if there's this is like rock or experimental or ambient you know what i'm saying like oh, yeah. are, are we even going okay. there anymore well uh only from the outside you know because like i don't want to put a label on anything i remember this this famous you know it was some tv talk show interview with the beatles in 1964 and they're asking paul mccartney so like what kind of music is this and he's just like well we don't even like to think about that you know yeah it's a distraction it's music here and so for me, um, as I said before, I mean, this is a totally intuitive process. And if I start thinking about what kind of genre I'm writing, that just submarines the whole thing. So I don't think about it at all. It just kind of comes out. And I'm, and, but at some point when it's done, I look at it and just go, what did I do here? You know? Yeah, right, you know? yeah, right, right. Because in terms of, you know, getting it, well, let me put it this way. I would like people to hear this, you know, so somehow I have to get it before people who are the right people to listen to it, who are going to get it and appreciate it and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Sure. And I don't think it's like hard to approach music. It's kind of easy, but it's um, songs are a little bit long. If you, um, you know, have all the solos and stuff, um, you know, uh, for radio anyway, although I have, I'm making radio edits of them. Are you really? They just take out all the good parts, except the vocals. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. but um but yeah, they just don't seem to sort of fit anywhere that is already defined. And you know, with Napster, I don't, I don't know if you remember like the structure of that, like mm -hmm. you could browse for genres. And the first thing I noticed was that, you know, there's like 25 different genres of metal yeah. Yeah. that come up. Yeah. Yep. You know? And then there are things like a student of mine turned me on to this, uh, the, a genre called doom wop. Doom what? Doom, doom wop. wop. So it's like wow. like doo wop, really, yeah, like a this doom really wop. dark, turgid kind of doo wop. Doo wop, doo wop, doo wop, 
do up the dog all like yeah. that. Okay. Um, so yeah, they just come on, Aaron. Stuff out there. But what I notice is when I go to sort of sample stuff out there in the world, what I find is that the stuff that's being I don't know if it's so much the stuff that's being made that's really visible, but the stuff that's being curated that's showing up, for instance, on all these playlists, tends to be pretty narrow in its stylistic intention, which is just fine. Hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, a dance tune needs to be a dance tune and can't have an extended ambient middle section or right. something. I mean, right. It's so, um, you know, so it makes sense. But, you know, on the other hand, if you're going to try and, you know, move the music into the world, you kind of need to know where to move it. So, yeah. So that for me, you know, I didn't even really think about that that much. But now I'm just going, oh, yeah, who needs to hear this? as much well, as we fun. don't want to be labeled. And I understand where yeah. you're coming from, Tony, and I get that up very much. So we need well, not we, but society likes labels that well, way when i, I go to you. itunes yeah. or when i go to whatever podcast i want to listen to i know exactly what to type in because seo is yeah you know yeah, search yeah, yeah. engine optimization what i type into google or what i type into youtube mm -hmm. all the algorithms know exactly where to point me so that stuff as much as we don't want to be and i you know it, it's had it, that exact phrase of you know well what what kind of music do you are you writing or how would you how would you Classify. label your music for yeah. decades as long as I've lived and no matter who I ask as an artist they're like oh you know it's it's something different or I don't know how to classify it because it's and we all don't want on a personal level we don't want to be labeled because we want to think of ourselves as unique as unique right but right. the reality is we yeah. all exist within some kind of label or some kind of category genre so people can identify with that right yeah, and sometimes we don't even know, right? You know, sometimes you're just too close to the stuff, and you just go, I don't know what this is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's a challenge. You know, it's a challenge to sort of as an as a new artist. I mean, if you've been around for a while, um, you know, say ten years or more, you know, you've probably evolved with the system anyway. So mm -hmm. it just sort of picked you up as it went along. But um, you know, like w if Radiohead was a new band. Mm -hmm what would that like what spotify playlist would would that go on right. um you know yeah so, true yeah so that but that's the business model that we're kind of living with now i was going to ask aaron i was going to say because this is like you know you've particularly been taking the podcast running with it but this is more your wheelhouse is mm -hmm. sort of like seo optimization all that stuff yeah mm -hmm. um is, is it something today where people let's say create music have to start thinking about fitting into a certain classification when they're writing music is, is you think that's, that's something that we have to do nowadays is say well I'm, I'm writing whatever i want to write but I, I have to label this as rock because i know that on the internet which is my main mode of transmission mm -hmm. that this is where this is what i get i can't i can't be so eclectic that i can't be like the guy down the street that just makes you know the stuff that nobody can talk about because it's so out there you know what i'm saying that was me as a academic really <laughs> Well, you know, that world has got a lot of really abstract music in it, you know. Um, that's partly why it's in the academy, because it's not, you know, it's got to live in that greenhouse, uh -huh. you know, to survive. I mean, there's not a commercial, you know, viability for somebody writing, you know, atonal chamber music. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it's really interesting. And then, I, then I start thinking yeah. about, like, Aaron and I are big gamers, so... Yeah. This is something you didn't know about me, Paul. This you, is like I <laughs> used to be. <laughs> oh no, no, come on. Not come anymore. On. Not since the uh, podcast. Well, okay, then I am. Anymore. I dropped like six six hundred hours on Red Dead. Uh -huh. Anyway, um, so you have like bands like Sixty Five Days of Static that are these experimental bands, right? Mm -hmm. They have yeah. these. I mean, they have success. They are doing what they need to do, and well, they have different yeah. outlets, though. They have, you know, they. Uh, well, a lot of it's based on live performance. I mean. I don't know if you guys know Godspeed You Black Emperor, this band from Montreal. They, you know, it's like, it's a large, it's built on a rock band. So there's like a rock band core, but there's like three guitar players and two drummers, you know, it's kind of big. And then, but there's a chamber orchestra around it and a visual, a visual, um, what am I talking about? Like a video person mm -hmm. and a live sound person. There's a lot of captured audio that goes into it, but their, their, their songs are like 20 minutes long. So it's back to the old, 
prog rock days of the early 70s yeah. but these are like it's informed by say american minimalism you know so it's like a lot of patterns slow builds long big arch formed kind of things they're really successful popular group but like you guys are really literate musicians and don't know about it. So there's yeah. all kinds of stuff out there that's going on like that and it can be successful but you got to have somebody that knows what they're doing mm. um in terms of uh you know marketing i guess yep yeah uh, yeah yeah uh, absolutely uh, yeah and how to how to deal with the i mean money is what makes a lot of the stuff sustainable or not so if you really know how to do that then you can do it that's why when i was 19 i'm like i don't know what the hell i'm doing um i know how to do the academy i can see that that's a yeah. clear path for me um you know or, but or these you know, unrealistic kind of uh, sort of representations where you take, take like a band like you're just talking about they're not gonna be mm -hmm. playing at the church bazaar down here they're just not gonna do that i mean it's just it's not the right kind of audience i mean and, right yeah 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 but but you got to cultivate that audience somehow so you know a mix of live and recorded things you know it's always sort of been part of that formula it's just a little different now yeah. you know um you know and it can take different forms i mean one of the one of the advantages of say rap music for instance is like you know you, you guys are playing rock bands you know how it is you got to schlep all this heavy gear you know um it's just a big thing it's like if you're a rapper um you need a mixer and a couple of things that look like turntables and you don't you show you up do anything you know so the the that's just all the changing nowadays technology. too as well though what's that I said, that's also changing as well um oh sure it's all weeks, over. yeah a couple weeks ago we had uh um ryan brown on um and he was just talking about his helix and how the days of amps and all lugging all that stuff is completely gone all he does is bring his board and that's it good night mm -hmm. he has everything he plug needs. in yep yeah yeah i mean how many well, guys show up with a laptop and plug in and that's everything on ableton or something mm -hmm. in there there's you know what i mean there's... well even even old school people i mean you remember getty lee used to play he just ran direct into the thing and since alex lyson had all those amps over there he just had a bunch of dryers yeah yeah you know, yeah, yeah 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 right six tumble dryers yeah instead. one to a rerun he he had that so yeah i mean everything's getting more portable but you see what um, he just did by the way did you see how he played in a mall do you no, see that alex getty? No. yeah no getty no he just he showed up one day randomly in a yeah. mall in toronto Mm -hmm. And just set up this gear as a one man band. He called it Dr. Lee's one man band. He dressed up and he put on a hat and glasses. Right. Nobody knew who he was. Yeah. He just sitting there playing and 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 he just played two hours. And, and the funny part was, you should look this up on YouTube. The funny part was somebody said, Hey, play YYZ. And he's playing a ukulele, started playing YYZ. And the I guy knew. goes, Yeah, the ukulele. And everyone's like, That's really good. It sounds just like it. And nobody knew it was Getty. Oh, that's <laughs> yeah, well, that's great. I know, that's great. It's great. No, I, yeah, it's, it's crazy. I mean, um, I, if you guys like film there, there is a movie, uh, I just watched a documentary. I love documentaries, especially about music. And there's a documentary I just watched about, uh, rap and hip hop lyricism. And it's called word is power. If you get a chance check this, check this documentary out, it's about the early days of hip hop and how it sort of progressed into sort of like what's going on now. And what I was really sort of fascinated with was how complex and intricate hip-hop lyrics are i mean these guys invent a notation they, they'll show you like on the their lyrical sheets they have like little dots and dashes almost like morse code mm -hmm. for where the rhythms and the beats lie. i mean they're really into it you know i mean when i was a kid growing up I'm like oh that's just stuff that is you know something i culturally don't understand but it's really interesting there's really a lot of complexity behind it you know everything people do gets that mm -hmm. like everything that people do will develop that and I like country music. Okay, you think of country music as this incredibly formulaic kind of thing, right? Yeah. So, you know, the 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 paradox hook, you know, that she got the gold mine, I got the shaft, you know, that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. One of the reasons that I check in on country music, not often, but but now and then, is just to listen to see what new, incredibly inventive ways people have come up with doing that exact same thing. Mm -hmm. you know? On one hand, I could stay and be your loving man, but the reason I must go is on the other hand, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. those that formula. I mean, there's a lot of them, but just that one, the creative ways that people come up with to solve that one is just fascinating to me. I mean, human brains are just extraordinary. Yeah. 
And it doesn't matter how formulaic or fixed something might be. I mean, they're going to come up with, you know, cool ways with lots of layers. And, you know, it's just people are interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Reinventing but, the wheel over and over and over and over again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, Paul, you have, you have an interesting look. I mean, I, I, as someone who has been involved in music composition for as long as you have, and sort of seen it through the through the lens of history, right through Western art music. You know, You're what I'm saying, saying like, I'm old, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, like seeing things like you and I. I mean, Aaron and I can never speak right to the volumes that you can, and like Beethoven and Brahms and all the classical guys you can. What well, I want to know is, um, has much really changed? Do you think in the last few hundred years in terms of musical writing? Um, I know stylistically, yes, but I mean, in terms of the mechanics of things and are we just kind of doing the same, just with different spins on things? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 I mean, what changes is the social context and the tools. Okay. So, you know, like Beethoven had the piano, right? Um, but he also had, you know, like a, a, a composing environment socially and economically, because he had patrons he had to please too, um, you know, that, that helped shape what he came up with but i think the you know the fundamental question of i have an a need to create a thing of a certain kind and how do i do that um still has all the same components you know it's it's from a from an intuitive impulse to some sort of concept to now thinking of it as you know having intellectual structure components and whatever until you make the whole thing finished um the pathways are different but everybody's still walking you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah um so no i don't think it's really changed i think that's one of the things that excites me is that when i remember to do it um i don't always remember to do this but when i sit down and try and work uh to to just not take for granted this process that you know a lot of something really cool might happen if i just shut up and pay attention and go about my business mm -hmm. you know the way I want. And I don't think that's any different for me than it was for, you know, somebody writing music 400 years ago, or for that matter, somebody writing music today in Senegal, you know, yeah. or something. you know, it's just like, it's just, it's just people creating things and allowing themselves. I think one of the liberating things about creating things is it just allows yourself yourself to let suspend the rules a little bit and just go, what if, what if, what if I yeah. try this, you know, what if I try this weird thing? And the beauty of digital audio workstations, of course, is there's always Command Z. You know. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, least, that was awful. The no one will ever know that I did that. You know, gone. You know? Aaron, how, how's the the songwriting classes going with your with your students? I know you were mentioning a while back you were getting delving into this. Is that yeah um, working pretty well? Um, I I mean. <laughs> I'd love to say it's going great. For the ones that participate, it's going great. Uh, it's just really hard to get people to engage. Uh, songwriting is hard. It takes a lot of decision making um, and it takes a lot of, you know, just going with it. Uh, and it's for scary. Some, yeah, it's, it is. Yeah. It's, it's scary. And for some, uh, for some odd reason, I don't possess that. <laughs> The and fear I, it's, part? Yeah, it's it's very interesting to me that I mean, there's so many people, so many of my students, and I would venture to say a good 90%, if not more, they just don't know how to take the plunge. They don't know how to just say, okay, I'm going to go ahead with this idea. or And if that doesn't work, I can always have more ideas. It's that fear of just being able to do it that holds them back from the entire process. Uh, yeah, no, no matter I how much it. I teach yeah. the process, no matter how much I walk them through the process or give them examples of the process, when I lay it back on their hands, their lap, it's always, I, I just don't know. And it's like singing. Like you, you, you don't, when you sing, it's, I, I was always looked at it. Like if you sing, it's like, that's your voice out there. And it's like a representation of you. Mm. If your singing sucks, if you're a bad singer, you're like, oh, I just feel awful. Mm. I've always looked at songwriting the same way. That if you write something and put it out there, people are like that's not good. You're like, oh, uh, something kind of. There's something icky about me. You know what I'm saying? And it's just, yeah. Because you wrote bad music. Yeah. yeah right. I, I've always been of the thought of 
well, what is bad music? No right. matter what you write at any one point. Now, obviously, there is such a thing as bad music, but is there? But you're always going to have an audience somewhere. Someone out there is always going to be be able to identify with you and your style or the words that you're putting down or the emotion that you're putting out. Um, they you do have an audience. There are people who will identify with you. And that 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 fear is what holds so many people back that if you would yeah. just kind of say, look, I am me and that's OK. I'm just going to put it out there, whether I can sing, mm -hmm. whether I can play yeah. or not. I'm just going to put it out there and there will be people who appreciate what you do no matter yeah, what. Yeah, it's a fearlessness. Yeah. yeah. Do you guys know who Wesley Willis is by any chance? No. no. Okay. no. Wesley Willis, oh, I don't know if I ever got it. I'll do it real quick. Wesley Willis was a street musician that lived in Chicago, hugely popular guy. And he wrote hundreds of songs that are all basically the same song. And he did it with a little Casio thing with a bunch of rhythm patterns on it and stuff. Um, Homeless guy for a long time, um, incredibly social. Um, when he would meet his fans, he would do this head bump thing with them. It was this ritual. It's like that was his greeting. He would kind of bump their head. Mm -hmm. Really, you know, and he had a callus on his head from doing it to so many people. That's how <laughs> popular this guy was. Um, yeah. Bands, there, there are tribute albums where bands, like rock bands, have covered his songs mm -hmm. and stuff. But if you listen to this stuff, you just go, this is the weirdest music I've ever heard. It's just, dink, 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 you know, stuff on a Casio and this big, guy bellowing you know words about you know nirvana playing at the agora ballroom or whatever you right. know um yeah so you just never know what's gonna connect with with people you know but but the 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 thing about the fear of creating things almost always comes from that thing we were talking about earlier where you have to just block off any sort of evaluative judgment of what you're doing while you're doing it. Right. Right. So right. You right. Do that, then you can sort of say, okay, now I'm going to close that door and, and, and now we'll look at the stuff and say, well, what's, you know, what's accept acceptable, you know, based on whatever that might be. A couple of years ago, I, uh, I met John Searles. I don't know if I ever told you guys the story. John Searles, the editor for Cosmopolitan, and uh, he was given a lecture up here in one of the local libraries. So Trey said to me, you got to go talk to this guy if you want to get into some writing. And I sat through his lecture for like half an hour, whatever it was. And I went to a book signing and sit down with him. And actually, he was a really nice guy. He sat with me for like an hour. And I said to him, I said, John, I said, I'm really struggling with this writing thing. What can you tell me? He's like, well, what's the, what's the big problem for you? And I said, I'm always judging if what I'm writing is good or bad. He goes, "That's you got it backwards. Right. Goes, you don't think about good or bad. You think about what kind of audience can I build? Now, that's the guy who edited for Cosmo for like 20 some years. And he's like, yeah. you're building an audience. It's not about good writing or bad writing. It's like you're, you're getting your voice out there connecting to people. Mm -hmm. That's the main thing. About as close as, as it is, like, about as close as you can get to worrying about what anybody else thinks um, that's not destructive, I think, actually is one of these oblique strategies cards. It's one of my favorite ones when it comes up. It's, would anybody want it? Hmm. That's would anybody want it? like yeah, your it, value for it thing. yeah and you can either accept or reject that as a valid thing but but it, sometimes it's just good because you get so head down in the task you know you're just buried in the engine you know and you're not really noticing like would anyone want to drive this vehicle oh man um and anybody could be anybody yeah. including yourself and actually most importantly yourself what i want it because sometimes i forget that i forget like you get so caught up in the task, you just go, "Am I? Would I enjoy what I'm doing here if I just encountered it?" You know, that's crazy. It's a valid question. You know, it's a great question. It's yeah. going to save me a lot of time in my youth. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I remember it's the time I I was like in the house for like remember on Driftwood Drive for like three weeks. You know, just kind of never coming out of the house and just writing stuff. There's, there's a certain aspect of like, okay, that's just borderline either creative or just being nuts. Well, I think we get, I, I do think we get inside of our heads a little bit too much, too much. at points, yeah. especially as creatives. Yeah. Um, but there is a time when you have to be uh, confident in who you are and just not care. You just, yeah. you, you can't change, yeah. you can't change what's, 
who you are specifically, and you can't change what's going to come out of you. <laughs> that's for sure. Right. I mean, <laughs> there's nothing you can do that's going to change that as a person. You yeah. are who you are, and you're going to write, and you're going to sound like who you are no matter what. And as long right. as you can accept that and be comfortable with that, then all of that fear and all of that other stuff, what people were going to think and blah, 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 all of that goes away and you are yeah. now free to just be who you are, you are. and it's write fearless. it, record it, and whatever happens from there is okay. Do you guys know Daniel Johnston? That name sound familiar? Yeah. Daniel Johnston? Okay, he was the guy, Paul, who Kurt Cobain looked up to. In fact, one of the old Nirvana shirts, so you see like the smiley face with the two X's over mm -hmm. was, or wasn't that the logo? It was it was the logo for Daniel Johnston record. Anyway, Daniel Johnston was a pioneer in lo-fi, and Daniel Johnston was this guy. In fact, I think he's got schizophrenia or something, right? Aaron, like, did he do this thing where oh, he was he was flying an airplane with his or his dad was flying an airplane and in the flight he took the keys out of the ignition and crashed the plane. He has a lot of mental illness, but uh, Daniel Johnston is this uh, singer songwriter back in the I think in the late '90s, early '90s. He was producing this lo-fi records. You're just getting up kind of like this, like, I don't know, a Casio keyboard, but just getting up with just a guitar and pounding out and wrote these lyrics that Kurt Cobain loved. He idolized this guy and uh, and dedicated a lot of, you would see it in the old, in the early Nirvana stuff. He was actually paying tribute to this man. And uh, it, ju it just gives me like, it, it makes me think about this guy who obviously didn't give a f about, you know, what the industry was saying. He just went up there and mm -hmm. just did his own voice and was who he was and and people he got he had a little following and and mm -hmm. you can go on the internet today and, and look up his stuff and there's there's a fan base you it's can amazing. do anything you want as long as you can find the right people who will get it yeah right i mean i look at somebody like mike Patton, you know oh yeah from mr bungle yeah i mean i look at bungle and i'm just like okay there's like millions of people like this stuff <laughs> oh yeah but when you first play it for somebody that's never heard it they're just like this, this is weird it's just <laughs> actually is insane you know yeah, yeah. Well, he's an interesting guy <laughs> yeah yeah you know so uh but he's also this force of nature as a human being so you know he's obviously gonna you know part of that engine is going to go toward making sure that you know this is you know, well distributed and available, and, oh, yeah. Yeah. and he's he's got a whole shtick with. That. He was a he was arrested. Did you hear about this? Uh, he had a suitcase full of sex toys. What? He was arrested in a hotel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. sure. Exactly. So what? I mean, that's the thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> the music kind of, you know, that's not inconsistent. No, no. And, but what I love about Mike Patton is when you when you look at him, like look him up, like on any kind of not that Wikipedia is the litmus test for our identity mm -hmm. today, but maybe it is in the 21st century. Um, mm -hmm. But it's a he classifies himself as a voice artist more than oh, anything sure. else. Yeah, and and you get that. Well, yeah, but he's also one of the most literal. I mean, just listen to this stuff. And as somebody, like I said before, who's, you know, like my listening habits are really broad, not that deep, but it means I've heard a lot of the stuff. So it's like I listen to these Mr. Bungle recordings and I'm like, that's Balinesian cat jack singing. This is from some West African tradition. This is some weird Italian futurist music stuff that's in here. And he seems to know this huge body of literature and obviously like one of his big influences john zorn i don't know if you oh, was it really I, I know john zorn did oh yeah i didn't, I didn't know Patton was into him yeah oh, that's interesting any of the cobra stuff or um you know the i mean even naked city you know you just well go, yeah i mean you you turned me on to that album with bill yeah. fussell yeah yeah so it's this very sort of avant-garde one-way trip kind of music that you don't know what's going to happen next right you know and actually here's the thing i love about that the place You'd never guess where everybody got that. So composers like Zappa and all these people who write this music that's like really progressive and and sounds like that. It's Carl Stalling, the guy who was the music director for Looney Tunes, the Looney Tunes cartoons. Because awesome. you think about that stuff and it's all situational. Mm, yeah. You know, not falling down the stairs kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so when you think about uh -huh. think about Zappa, you know, you just go, oh, really episodic. This little thing, this little doodle, this incredibly virtuosic thing. And if you go back and listen to those recordings from the sessions for those cartoons, these orchestras were amazing. These people are sight reading this stuff. You oh, know, yeah. so like, okay. are they really? Oh yeah. Oh, wow. Three, four. Oh yeah. 
I mean, there was no multi-track back then. <laughs> well, yeah, right. I never, yeah. There are recordings of these sessions with, uh, you know, with him talking to the group, you know, and um, yeah, it's incredible. But it was a huge influence on generations of American composers, yeah. John Adams, even, you know. Um, but it all starts with a guy named Ray Scott, and uh, the, the, you could do a whole podcast on Ray Scott. Ray Scott was a jazz musician in the 20s and 30s. He started out, he had the Ray Scott Quintet, which was actually six people, which kind of gives you a hint of this guy's personality. So, But what the way he would do it, this is kind of an interesting creative tool. He would have them improvise, and they would just screw around until something cool happened, and he'd go, do that again, and then he would write it down, right? Uh and build stuff out of that. So what he was doing, he was using jazz musicians to create compositions that were fixed pieces. So he would have them play these things and they're crazy. You can go look them up. They're just these not long, you know, two and a half minute crazy little things, really virtuosic. So you need really good players. But I think the jazz musicians got bored with not being able to improvise because ultimately they're just playing the same notes every time they play. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so he had a hard time making this work for uh, in a sustainable way so he invented the sequencer mm. to wow. come up with okay. combinations of notes and durations and stuff to be able to figure out you know like oh that's a good idea so he's basically creating intuitively generated found objects well when robert moog and his dad came along to buy circuits for their theremin business mm. Moog walks into this place and sees this guy that's got these modulars okay. and generators and sequencers and all this stuff and just goes, oh, this could all be in one thing, okay. you know? Hence the yeah. Moog synth was great. Right. So not only did he kind of is the father of the modular synthesizer, he invented this way of making music that has had this huge influence on American composers and nobody's heard of the guy. He also did kind of funny commercials and stuff. Like he made a lot of his music. He lived in New York. He had a two room apartment, one of which looks like the inside of a nuclear reactor because there's just like yeah, audio hardware. Um, yeah, and he would do these electronic compositions and stuff. And it worked with people like Jim Henson. There's a bunch of stuff that they did, this weird sort of 60s psychedelic spoken word art stuff. You know, where Jim Henson is pretending to be wandering around in his own brain and there's all these strange sound effects and stuff. But, yeah, there's all kinds of weird, innovative music that finds an audience. And, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to be on Spotify with three million listeners a month. Yeah. Well, that's just, yeah. It, it, Everybody, everybody's in that mindset, though. You know, it's hard. No, yeah. Right. And I don't think it needs to be that anymore. I think we need to, I think tech has made us to the point where we can literally broaden out and well, even even the absence of technology just you know there there are ways to be a musician and it goes back to something Aaron and i've talked about on this show many times mm -hmm. you know having a musical lifestyle yeah beyond the recording industry yeah it's just different you know yeah. but i think there's still got to be that interpersonal connection uh -huh. um the kind of thing that comes from live performance or you know that sort of thing um you know otherwise it's just it's just digital bits you know um, right. You know, I mean, and, and the artist that you're, I mean, <laughs> potentially the artist that you're following might not even be a real thing. Right. You know what I mean? I mean, you could fabricate an online band like so easy. Yeah. That's very true. You know, that's very let's true. All, let's all do that. <laughs> we should. <laughs> right. We See, should. We, let's make a new one. The three of us. An online band. <laughs> We're hard to play together anyway. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hey, I mean, you could do online concerts too. You could do, yeah. go the whole the whole route. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, people have been doing stuff like that. Um, the composer Tan Dunn did this interesting project a while ago where he um, put together. He wrote this piece of music and basically just said, um, "Okay, performers of the world." Mm -hmm get in front of your computer and play, you know, your part. And then he actually compiled a performance of this thing from all of the uh, missions. Um, you know, kind of a cool idea. Yeah. Um, I don't know how you could, you know, I mean, it's hard to come up with a, you know, a, a version of that that just involves like a rock band, but you know, well, yeah, I think that's, that's the point. It's just to kind of look at these new creative angles and uh, interesting ways of thinking about it. And I, for me, it's no different than like what, who was a Penderecki who was doing, who, was that the guy who was doing like the microphone swinging pendulum music? Was that him? Oh, pendulum music, Steve Reich. No, Steve Reich. Oh, yeah. So it's no. the same kind of, same kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. 
Anyway, there's lots of ideas out there and a lot of them are cool and not all of them have, you know, commercial viability. So, yeah. right. you know, and that's, that's, you know, that's just part of the, that's just part of the world. But some stuff surprises me. Like I still, I'm, I'm shocked when I think that, you know, back in 1973, you know, bands like Yes are touring, playing Tales from Topographic Oceans to like full arenas. Yeah. Like, yeah. wow. Okay, cool. In fact, that's, that's my sweet spot for my musical influences because I was like 12 years old or something when that came out. So, you know, that was some of the earliest stuff I encountered. And I just thought, oh, this is perfectly normal for, you know, a whole arena full of people to show up to watch a band open their set by playing the finale from The Firebird by Igor Stravinsky. Right. Like, what? You know, how, how is that even happening? You know, I can't imagine that sort of thing going on today. So, um, so yeah, you just never know. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. But it's kind of a magical thing. I mean, just the not knowing, I guess, you know, is, is part of it. Yeah. yeah. You never know when you've made something really cool. And artists are often surprised by what they make, what by what of what they make actually seems to get traction. Right. You know, we weren't thinking about that as a, that was just like a B-side at best. And, yeah. but it's the hit, you yeah. know. Oh yeah, yeah you as an artist, huh? Yeah, you as an artist have no idea what the masses are going to like. <laughs> just... you know, Joe Perry has lots of regret about Dream On hmm. because he, wow. he just thought, well, this is just a throwaway tune, you know. And so his guitar work on it, he's not happy with, you know, because he just kind of went in and laid down the tracks and went back to you know doing whatever he's doing, and according to him, anyway. And um, right. yeah, you know, he just didn't, he didn't know. Yeah, no. Yeah, that's crazy. There's no way of knowing. Yeah, I don't think Stevie Nicks' new landslide was going to be what it was either. No, no. It's it's it's. And she it's was a, like 19 or something. Yeah. I mean, what would she know? Yeah. yeah, and it goes back to like it, you know, all the way back to the beginning and in your album, Paul. Um, you know, when you're writing it, you don't really know what's going to become of it, but you know, mm -hmm. it it is. It's a part of you. You're putting it out there and. I did have one question um, in terms of your album. Yeah. Um, who all was involved? Because I know listening to the album, there's there's a lot going on. So what yeah. parts are you responsible for and what parts are other parts responsible for? Well, basically, I do everything on there except for drum set. Okay. And the there's Anchors has a cellist on it, Elizabeth Jeremeka. Okay. Um, and uh, so drum set players are Spencer Inch and Kevin Lowe, okay. um, both, you know, people I know from Pennsylvania. And uh, then the last track, the, all the female vocals are my daughter, Elizabeth, actually. Okay. Yeah, just lots and lots of takes. Yeah. And, <laughs> in, and in terms of like giving, uh, are these pre-planned, because you had talked about earlier how you kind of sing your parts out one like that. Is that a process that you went through in terms of giving them the pieces or how did you communicate to them in terms of what you were looking for within the, within the scope of. Oh, I see what you're saying. Well, basically with the drummers, what I did was I wrote a drum, I wrote all the drum parts. Okay. You know, so I just wrote them out. Um, we went in, um, laid down those things with a lot of latitude. So it's like, here's a fill I wrote. You can play it, you know, but right. let's make sure you do your own thing. Right. And then after we, I was pretty sure that we'd gotten, you know, enough material based on what I composed. Then I just said, okay, now let's do some takes, just whatever. Right. Like mm -hmm. try different feels, try a different, you know, and sometimes that was hard for them because they'd already been playing what I wrote, you mm -hmm. know, so they had to kind of bust out of that. But, but some of the stuff that's on there are things that were, I mean, you know, things that they just contributed to the thing. But most of it's, you know, notated out, you know. Okay. So if I wanted to do it with a band and then I had a drummer that read, um, you know, we could just do it. Right. But um, uh, the cello part was all written out, um, you know, and the challenge on that was it's all glissandi, you know. So I was trying to get a classical cellist that's used to using all four fingers right. to, to okay. play everything on one finger, you know. Um, that was about the only difficulty with that. And then with my daughter, it was just like, sing these notes. Here's the, here's the melody, you know, just do it. I'll give you a reference pitch you can kind of tune to and just sing it yeah. over and over again. I'll get a bunch of takes and then we'll, I'll build a choir out of you. Wow, um, that's cool. that was it. And the rest of it was me just laying down 
you know, guitar and vocal tracks and playing percussion and, uh, you know, synthesizers and, you know, whatever, because I had the, I mean, one of the advantages of not having to take a band into a studio to do something is that you can, you know, really dig in and, and mess with it until you're pretty sure it's right, which is good news because the final product you're happy with, the bad news is it just slows the whole damn thing down. Right, so right. It's potentially you're never done. And most of your parts were recorded in your studio that you have there or that's it. Yeah. That's another whole thing. These, th I don't even know where half of this stuff was recorded. It was either recorded um, in my, some of it was recorded here, but this is fairly recent. We haven't lived here that long. Right. Uh, some of it was recorded in my little studio in my attic in Pennsylvania. Um, some of it was um, some of the takes, like we did the drum parts in the studio at Penn state because we had a better room and right. really more, more good preamps than yeah. I had in my studio. So, um, uh, and then, well, actually, four of the tracks were recorded at the at the studio of an engineer friend of mine, Bob Klotz, who oh, okay. um, yeah. produced it. And um, yeah, so Bob and I have been working together for a long time. So he was he was a big help on this. Cool. But yeah, but mostly it's just me and my workstation, and you know. Yeah, that was the other thing I was going to say. The production value on the album is is wonderful. Uh, obviously, it's... I'm glad to hear you say that because it was a learning process, and that I'm is. happy with some of it. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you can't tell, I'm I'm good. Yeah, yeah, no. I I uh, I was uh, fairly impressed with uh, with the production value, and now it is that uh, is that something that you mixed on your own, uh, and and also on top of that, mastering. Uh, well, yeah. Okay. So mixing, basically how a lot of this worked was I did the preliminary mixing. Okay. And then I worked with Bob because yep. um, he, you know, just to have that other set of ears on it. And also he's got some instincts that I value that, you know, I, I knew I could rely on. Yeah. Um, he also has, you know, the guy's got 80 different compressors on his workstation. You know, it's like, so... <laughs> Let's try that tape head emulator on the bass. Right. Okay. You know, great. So, so a lot of the sweetening on four of the tracks anyway happened with him. Um, I did all the stuff on the other ones, mm -hmm. but um, but then mastering was done at um, Air Show Mastering in um, Colorado Springs. Okay. Hey guys, I don't mean to cut this short, but I, I have to I have to run. But if you guys want to continue, by all means, uh, uh, do so. I just want to jump in here, but um, it was great. Chad, with both of you, uh, great catching up. Paul, thank you so much. It's been awesome. Um, so, yeah. Always good to see you, Tony. Yeah, same. Even from so far away. Yeah, it's All great. Right. It's Mexico. Mexico. <laughs> we'll come out. I mean, beautiful place, but it's not. It's on the way to, like, nowhere. <laughs> Which is a good thing. It is. Or in some ways, yeah. Yeah, it it's is. really nice. Yeah. All right. Take care, gents. Yeah. Thank right. you. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. yeah. All right. How are we doing, Aaron? Awesome. Yeah, man. That that sounds awesome. I mean, I I'm unlike Tony, I'm very much into the technical part of it, the recording and the and the and the mixing and the, the actual process that goes into re the, the recording of the album, the concepts. Uh that that's always fascinated me for as long as I can live. Well, I um, can tell. I didn't think all the stuff around you was like just a decorating scheme. <laughs> <laughs> I see that I saw the the other camera angle with the two deluxe. Yep. Yep, and the twin. You know, like yeah. That's yeah. You're you're obviously really dedicated to that. Yeah, yeah. Sound uh, sound is uh, you know it's it's important to what goes into our in, into our ears <laughs> yeah. that it sounds well, good. I picked my my good vocal mic. Yeah, for today. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, no, I, I really enjoyed the album. It, it's uh it's a uh, it's very well done. Uh, and so there's just the seven tracks on it then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you know, there was I had nine originally that I was gonna like had mapped out, but it's I swear every place that I tried to stick two of those tunes just broke the thing. Oh. And you know, and I also had the experience, um I'm gonna talk about another artist here, but when the back album Colors came out okay. a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, I, the production on that album is really interesting to me because it's just two people. It's yeah. just back in this producer he worked with in L.A. playing everything and doing the production. And so I paid real close attention to it. And I just thought, wow, this is a fantastic album. But then when I realized um, after, I don't know, a few listens, it's like, yeah, these three tracks are really kind of this is where 
stuff goes to die. Right. So I actually went and made a playlist. Um, I called it Colors Re- Delamed, I think. Is what <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and it, was, it actually was seven tracks that when I played it, it, it was so much better mm. than the 10 or whatever, I don't even know, 11 or whatever that are on the, for me, right. you know, I, for just for me, it, it just worked so much better. And there was no like, oh, that's, that's, you know. Yeah. So I, I just thought, you know what, it's going to be 35 minutes instead of 45 or whatever, you know, but as a, as an architecture, it just, it just worked. Yeah. And no other arrangement of those songs worked the same way and so i just thought okay screw it i'm just going to come up with this i'll have i'll have two more songs for the next album yeah that's exactly right yeah that's that's exactly right there are there are really with with the digital age there really are no rules anymore you know the album of 78 minutes on an album that that's all gone wayward really it it can be anything you want as an artist you can be releasing things monthly you can be releasing eps every couple of months or whatever it is it's uh no totally i want to do some that are just four or five song suites yeah the set but you run into this thing with the music industry though that in terms of distribution technically to be an album Mm -hmm. it needs to be 30 minutes long Otherwise, it's got to be released as a bunch of singles. That's kind of really how the business model plays right. out. Okay. So you do have to kind of play with that. Right. A little. Okay. Like if you want to, you know, put out an album, you can put it out as an album. But in terms of things, um, um, in terms of the way it's registered, you know, with like performance rights and all that kind of stuff, um, it matters the right. time. You know, but that's the only factor. Otherwise, yeah, I mean, you know, just put out whatever, whenever. Yeah. It's it, it's kind of nice that way, you know, that you just have those options. Now, what to do? That's another whole story, I mean, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, yeah. Tell me about it. I'm, I'm very much in the early part of the learning curve on that. I mean, it's kind of nice to to be really in the middle of one's beginnerness. Yeah. Especially at my age, you know, when I've been kind of thinking about this stuff for this long, to just go, yeah, I love the fact that some of the stuff is totally new to me that I just don't, you know, I haven't worked it out or uh, to the extent that you ever work it, things out, you know, it's like, right. I don't have the feeling like I'm, I'm supposed to have expertise at this, you know, maybe other people like Tony might think I'm supposed to have expertise at it, <laughs> right. Uh, right. but I'm, I'm fully happy and in touch with the fact that I'm really kind of at sea when it comes to certain aspects of this, you know, yeah. and, and it's okay, you know, cause like I said, I made that choice a long time ago to, to not be Quinn. You know, right. yeah. um, you know, whereas he's somebody who's, you know, so in touch with his craft that I, it's inseparable from him. Right. Whereas for me, like the guitar, for instance, is like. I've gone for a year without touching a guitar, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but then the funny thing happens, like once I pick it up again and get sort of in some kind of playing shape, I notice that my playing is way better than it was before. I think it's just I've somehow become a better musician or just a more insightful person or something. I don't know what it is, but it's like all of a sudden it's like, oh, I I would never have played this like that before. Yep. You know? yeah. I think we get into ourselves a little too much when we have our instrument around us all the time. And we're kind of we have a direction. And when we take ourselves out of that for a long time and come back to it, we're just free. And we're we allow ourselves that that, you know, just to right. be able to go anywhere, do anything. And that's that's really refreshing. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the, the downside of taking those breaks, um, is that, you know, I wish I could play better. Right. Right. I don't consider myself like a bad guitarist or anything, but, but it's like, you know, there are people in the world that they're a guitarist. Yeah. Like they're just so good at that thing yeah. that, you know, there's a, like my wife was telling me about this guy that she saw at a, um, in a restaurant in Ontario mm. and it was karaoke night. Right. So, the karaoke machine was a guy with a guitar and people would just walk up and say, I want to play, I'm going to sing this. And he'd just go, yeah. well, how's this key? Yeah. <laughs> and just knew everything, you know, I'm just like, yeah. no, that's a real player. Yeah. You know, guys like Tommy Tedesco, mm. right. Yeah. You know, the, the, 
the LA session yeah. guy who could do anything. Like you just put him in the gig and he he's like, yeah, want to sound Mexican? Sure, I can do that. You yeah. want to sound, you know, whatever. He did this um, in that um, that Wrecking Crew documentary um, that's about those guys. Um, there's this great scene where he describes, for those of you who might see this, right. who've seen that, you'll know what I'm talking about. But when I was in college, when I was around this time where I was making this decision about, you know, do I want to be in a band or do I go into the academy if I can? Um, he was doing this um, tour, um, this kind of workshop thing that was funded by some foundation where he was just going around the country talking about, you know, being a musician and, and what he did. And so he did this little shtick as part of it that he did when he came to see us, which I loved, which was he had his guitar with him. Mm. And at the time, he was working on the TV show Charlie's Angels, the original one. Right. And, um, you know, so he said, yeah, OK, so I come into the session and they go, OK, so this part of this episode is based in Greece. Play something Greek. And he'd go, um, OK, well, how's this? You know, you play something. And they go, yeah, that's great. You know, yeah. and then they'd have another episode. And it's like, well, now they're in Spain or now they're in Brazil or something. And he would play basically exactly the same thing but change like one little thing about it, like maybe one little thing about the rhythm to make it like, a little dancier or, or throw in, you know, a kind of flamenco style scrape in the middle of a riff or something. Yeah. You know? And it was like, that was all it took. And that lesson of what kind of cues people need to understand the music, like how basic and simple that is, was profound, you know, but that guy could do anything. I mean, he's on half of the records that we, listen to from the 60s and 70s it yeah. seems like anything recorded in la practically yes he's on it you know yeah. it's amazing he's on all that beach boy stuff yeah you know yeah so those guys you know when i think about that or i think about a you know person like quinn who can probably like you could spend three hours just playing song after song after song with that guy if you happen to know them um is you know that's that's a kind of musicianship i really admire yeah you know oh, yeah. i really you know I can't even aspire to it. Um, I just can <laughs> admire it. You know, I really, I really like that. Yeah. Cause I mean, I'm a bass player, you know, yeah. I mean, I play bass in all kinds of different music and stuff, but it's not the kind of thing that you just get up a bunch of repertoire of songs you can play. No, you know, I mean, yeah, understandably. Yeah. You know, and that was fine. I mean, I love being the bass player in a band cause I, you know, you get to really shape the sound of the band, Yeah. but nobody knows it. So you can be kind of inconspicuous and really important at the same time, you know, and I'm, I'm pretty shy. I think probably the reason I, I didn't play guitar in these bands is just, you know, there are times where I just don't want to be that guy hanging it out, you yeah, know, I know exactly sometimes I do. And sometimes, <laughs> no, you know, so on a bad night, it was always kind of like, you know, yeah. that's not that much fun. Plus you got to memorize, you know, 40 guitar solos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know, yeah. if I play a wrong note, it's like the band doesn't sound so good. You know, if the lead guitarist blows something. Everybody knows what happened. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it's partly just cowardice. <laughs> well, but, I mean, that's all right, too. Yeah, but, well, the, at the end of the day, I have a lot of nice bass guitars. Right. So that's what matters. <laughs> Toys. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I mean, yeah, some of them are like part of me. I have a... Um, 75 jazz bass that i bought new it's my first serious bass yeah. you know and god it sounds great yeah you know i love that thing so it's awesome yeah but anyway so cool so uh, before we end here um yeah. what are your what are your future plans for writing music and, and albums and what do you plan to do from here um more of the same yeah. i mean at, at this point, I mean, it's early on, so that'll change. Right. I mean, I'm old enough to know that anything I decide I'm going to do is not going to look anything like I think it looks now. Right. Um, but, yeah, the plan is to just um, keep working on this stuff, get out a couple of, uh, you know, maybe put out a couple singles in the next few months, mm -hmm. um, uh, another album within the year, and just keep making these things and, um, you know, find people who dig it. Awesome. You know? I mean, so far that's been pretty easy, but then again, you know, most of the people that are encountering this thing, frankly, at this point, being the first project, um, are people that already know me, you know, yeah. in one way or another. I mean, they either know of me or, or, or not, but, you know, they're, um, 
it's it's early yet so there's not a lot of product right so that's really kind of the thing i just need to get you know like i said i have like i don't even know where i put this giant folder i had sitting around here but i mean it's just like projected song ideas or <laughs> the folders i have of finished arranged things that just need to be recorded yeah you know? I mean, everything in between so so there's a lot of creative work that's just been going on in the background that i haven't really had frankly the time or mental space to to work on so i'm going to move to new mexico mm -hmm. and get some you know kind of studio yeah um i'd like to get pictures of your space at some point by the way oh. yeah. <laughs> just to see i'm always interested in how people so, and how people do a room yeah you know? yeah no i um, like i like you am in a closet <laughs> so <laughs> yeah i mean you can okay i'm gonna do a plug here tony pitched this coffee um have you used, used sonar works at all oh yeah 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 okay all right that's what made this album possible because okay. i was mixing these spaces that i was just like no matter what i would do mm -hmm. i would just listen to it and just go i can't get rid of the clouds here right it doesn't matter what i do with the low mids it doesn't matter what i just can't quite get the space between all the things and it was just the rooms I was mixing in. And so right. um, when I used it in here, which literally, I mean, this is like, it's got all kinds of bad things about it. Yeah. As soon as I tested the room and got something to compensate for the room, it was like all of a sudden I could hear everything I had been doing in the last two years yeah. on this album. It's like, I didn't even remember that that part of the slide solo was in this song. Yeah. Like it was that profound a difference. Um, so yeah, anybody who's working in some crappy room, um, you know, I think could benefit from this. Which is the majority of everybody. <laughs> well, yeah. You know, it's just these days where it's like, I've got the recording gear and everything. I yeah. just can't manage to get a decent, you know, oh, it's more than the recording thing. Cause you can record anything almost anywhere and mm -hmm. make it and, and work with it, you know, yeah. like it, can, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, but it's the monitoring. It's the trying to listen to it and trying to figure out like what you're actually hearing. I mean, it's almost impossible if you're in this room with all of these resonances and nodes and, yep. you know, there's, there's nothing at, at 600 Hertz at the listening station. Like no matter what you do, you won't hear anything on that frequency band, you yep. know, and like, but you don't know until you fix it, you know, and then you kind of figure out that, I actually kind of was on the right track all along. That was the refreshing thing. Yeah. Was that it's like, oh, this should have worked. And it did. But I just couldn't tell. That's exactly know? right. Yeah. yeah How many times tell. you burn a CD or burn it to a, a, you know, a wave file and run out to your car and check it. And you're like, why the heck can I hear that? Or <laughs> where did that yeah, come where, from? <laughs> where's all the coming from? Right. This plate's rattling. I can't even hear that in my room. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That, that's, you know. But that's just part of what I mean about being a beginner. Yeah. I mean, I've been teaching audio production for a, a long time now, you mm -hmm. know, but yet at the same time, um, you know, there's just no substitute for a lot of trial and error yeah. and, um, you know, getting input from other people about what you're doing. And so, you know, for me, that's still fairly early on in the process. So, yeah. Um, you know, and I learned a lot. I mean, you'd learn more from teaching, obviously, than, you know, almost anything else, because yeah. now you have to be able to articulate what it is that you're trying to talk about in a coherent yeah. way. So you really have to understand it. And that helped me a lot, I think, you know, just you know, working with students and their projects and my own stuff and, um, you know, just trying to solve those problems. Yeah. Um, you know, in that context, I think was really informative. So I got to take some shortcuts, I think. Um, but you know, I'm, hell, I'm old enough to where I, it's like, I ought to get to do that a little bit. Right. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, um, All right, well, if you could tell everybody where they could go to find out more about you. Well, uh, Paul .com. mm -hmm. Good place to start. Um, it's actually a fairly new website, but it's got some basic information about this project and um, some about me. There will be more. Awesome. It's going to include a bicycling part too. I have to put that on there because that's like that's a huge part of my life. Right. Yeah. I, I know. Ever since you know back at state college, you were you were definitely into it then as well. So yeah, it's been it's been a while. 
yeah, it's kind of made life possible through, you know, I mean, I rode all winter and everything. I know I always commuted on bike and yeah. So hide your bikes. <laughs> get hit though. Very cool. Uh, and you obviously are on SoundCloud as well. Yep. And, uh, Twitter, Facebook, well, Instagram, any of that? Yeah. Facebook, um, the weed garden, you can find it on there. It's, uh, I mean, the things uh, everywhere it's, it's on, you know, um, all the download and streaming places. Good. Um, so you can find it, you know, pretty much wherever you go. Awesome. It's a, you know, I mean, it's the one with the green Dano Longhorn bass on it. Yeah. 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 It's pretty recognizable. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, that, that was my bass yeah. for a while. I had that bass and, um, you know, I actually have another one that's a modernized version of that bait like that one is a replica of the original which right. had it's got some issues you know it's 24 fret bass but it doesn't play a tune above about the 14th because it's just a piece of wood right. for a bridge right you know right. so um yeah this one's in tonable bridge and tuners and everything. i'm just like why do i have these two bases so <laughs> actually so that the album cover is a picture taken when i sold it on ebay oh okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so that's where that that's where that photograph came from. It didn't have the stickers on it and everything. That's right. right. Yeah. Uh, that's good. Good. Yeah. So anyway, well, thanks, Aaron. I really appreciate you having me. Yeah, no problem. Uh, we'll... Given the nature of the people that you've had on here before, you know, I just I'm really flattered that. Yeah. You know, no, as soon as I got the opportunity, I absolutely love to have you on, and uh, definitely would love to catch up with you in the future and see how uh, things are going. I'll let you know. I'll put you on. I mean, if you're not on the mailing list now, you will be. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'll keep you, in, I'll, I'll keep you informed. Awesome. Thank yeah, you, Paul. And, all right, man. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll see you later. Yeah, take it easy. All right. Bye. Bye.